Happy Labor Day, everybody. I'm going to give it just a minute for people to sign on since uh, it is a holiday and I know that this is the tough time of day for accessing the era, as we've discovered. Can anyone hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Yep. Just wanted to check, test my microphone because it wasn't working earlier. Oh, geez. Well, thanks for checking it. Thanks. Like your necklace. Oh, thank you. I started uh, reshopping at Charming Charlie, which I really like. They really? Sent me emails. <laughs> they're great. They uh, when you go in their stores, which you know, can't do right now, but they organize everything by color, so it's sort of a. Oh, that makes my life. That would make my life so much easier. Yeah, it's great. I have a friend whose husband is an architect. And he loves it. <laughs> he just finds it very soothing to walk in there. <laughs> awesome. All right. Okay. I was just wrapping up the activity we'll do today if we have time. If we don't, that's fine, obviously. So. Okay. Today we are going to finish up our lecture on uh, research. Um, I did get the uh, explain to the media two quiz graded and y'all did great. You all did, I feel like much better than the first time. The average was like an eight point something. So a B basically, which is fantastic. Um, so kudos to everybody for that. Um, before I get into the lecture, does anyone have any questions about logistics for the class? Anything like that? We have a couple weeks before our first test, so um, we don't have to worry about that right away. Okay. All right. Well, as people sign on, um, I am going to go ahead and share the slides. Um, and so we are going to uh, pick up where we left off. We had just finished talking about the experimental method, um, but we hadn't quite gotten to extensions of it. So I want to make sure that we give that uh, adequate time. So uh, we will get to that, um, go through the rest of our lecture. And then, like I said, if we have some time at the end, we'll do a group activity. If we don't, it's not the end of the world. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share screen, make sure I'm sharing the right thing with you all. Yes. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and stand up over here. All right. And make sure my chat is visible so you can see when y'all ask questions, which y'all have been asking really good questions over there. Okay. Minimize everything that's in my way. So it's easier for me to see that. All right. 
So happy Labor Day. <laughs> the past couple of years we have had class on Labor Day, which there's like some irony to that, obviously. Um, but I think in some ways um, it's fine. We keep trucking along, and especially this semester, if it means we can get through more class and in a safe way, we will do the best that we can. So. All right, so we had just talked about the experimental method and how we do random assignment and all that fun stuff. But there are several extensions of the experimental study, just as there are for the correlational study that we talked about last Wednesday. So one of them is quasi-experimental designs. So quasi-experiments involve examining differences that may also actually exist in groups uh, without random assignment. So for example, you couldn't ethically cause someone to have a phobia, right? Nor would we really want to, obviously. <laughs> like, there's no reason that as a psychologist, we'd be like, yeah, let's make someone have a phobia. Uh, so, or you wouldn't want to randomly assign someone to be abused as a child. Um, so what you would do is you would compare these individuals with match control subjects. So depending on your study, you match that on what's important. So obvious things like, age, gender, uh, socioeconomic status, race, what have you. Um, for example, in my studies, I often want to ma match on um, body weight, body mass index, um, just to make sure I'm not, have people who are, are dissimilar weights in two different studies. So this is a way we can do things like look at gender, where again, we can't randomly assign someone to have a certain gender identity, right? Uh, so it's a way to do this ethically and also just logistically, right? Now, natural experiments are another example of something we would not want to manipulate as psychologists. So um, these occur when nature itself or a larger man-made phenomenon manipulate the independent variable. So the example I have here um, coming up at the end of this week is of uh, September 11th. Uh, so I know many of you might not have been born or were really teeny, right, when September 11th happened. Um, I was in college, so it really did have a profound effect on me. I was a sophomore in college, um, and it was just horrific for everyone. Um, and so clearly, as psychologists, we would never want to cause something like that. But when something like that happens, we want to try to figure out how to help people in the midst of these type of crises. So, um, psychologists will come in and do studies to try to figure out the best way to help people. Um, so it was a, of great interest in clinical concern to examine the effects of those who witnessed the attacks or who were victims of the attacks themselves. Uh, studies have examined predictors of developing PTSD, um, the effectiveness of therapy for those who were, uh, who survived the attacks and even such considerations as the higher incidence of alcoholism among Red Cross workers who helped after the attacks. So again, we would never like gleefully say, you know, be excited about doing research after this, but we do it because it helps. So for example, I have a friend from grad school who after the tsunami in Japan uh, and the nuclear meltdown uh, was, he's not in the military, so he wasn't really deployed, but he was sent over there to do therapy uh, for people in the crisis, and a lot of what we learned from September 11th are the techniques that were used for uh, that scenario. So again, it's to help people more when unfortunately events like this happen. So. All right, any questions? All right, we're gonna talk about analog experiments. So analog experiments involve using animals in the lab. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Isn't that like animal cruelty? Well, it depends, right? This is a big, big issue, right? So it depends on what you're doing. So for example, one of the most famous uh, experiments we've done in psychology is uh, Coco the Ape, when we taught her sign language, right? But yeah, some people would argue that it is. Um, certainly our neighbors at PETA in Norfolk would have a big problem with it. Uh, yeah, and so they study um, learning, particularly in animals. So they'll do things like uh, 
Skinner, who we talked about last week, taught uh, rats to press a lever to get food and then tried uh, to see what behaviors they would do by pressing the lever to get the food. But yeah, there are also experiments where they, uh, you know, track rats' brain waves and those can feel really gross and unethical, right? So, um, yes, this is very controversial. Uh, it's certainly nothing I've ever done, um, but it's still done a lot in psychology. Sometimes they're done in other ways as well. So for example, when we want to study neurons, we'll often study those of uh, the giant squid because like the squid, they're giant. <laughs> so it's easier to see things. Uh, but yes, it is very problematic uh, in some cases and in other cases, um, it's almost like enrichment for animals that are not in the wild. So yeah, I'm not trying to sugarcoat it. There are definitely problematic things. I would never do this myself. Uh, but psychologists would argue that we get a lot of knowledge from it. So. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. So then there's single subject design, and these are often called single case experiments as well. So it's essentially you take the experimental method and you combine it with the case study method to make something more scientific. Um, so there are case studies that have been used to develop and test often techniques like therapy techniques within a scientific framework. So here you study the same person, the same individual over time, and you compare their behavior at various time points. Um, and it, particularly after you introduce whatever sort of treatment you think would be helpful. So a common single case experiment is the ABAB design. Um, and these just mean different phases of the experiment. So the first day is the baseline condition. This is before you do anything. This is a sort of, hey, the person is existing. Nothing's working to help them yet. The first B is where you introduce your independent variable. So whatever that treatment technique is, you're going to try. And often it's behavioral. Um, so we want to see if the participant's behavior changes after we introduce whatever intervention we're introducing. Um, and if it is, that's great. But it's possible that the change was random, right? And had something to do with something other than what we were doing. Um, and so we take away that IV again. And then we have our second A period. We see does the behavior revert to what it was before we introduce the treatment? And then we reintroduce our treatment, our technique, our independent variable at the second B and see if it happens. And if it's helpful, we don't take it away again. We just keep it there. And for this one, I think it's so much easier to have an example. Um, so I'm going to use this case of Chris. She's not a case I saw. I got this out of a book, um, but I think it's a really nice illustration. So uh, Chris was a 19-year-old female who uh, had developmental delays. <laughs> Sorry, I just noticed the things in the chat. Um, fine, everybody's like having running late things today. And then yes, crows. The crows can solve like crazy love with the puzzles. So that's a really good point. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, especially like new Kelvin and crows are like almost as smart as humans. It really surprises me. Um, but yeah, let me tell you about Chris. So Chris was 19 years old, but belt money to the late. So she, you know, was much more mentally age-wise um, like a child. And uh, she has a disorder called trichotillomania. You guys don't need to know that uh, term, but essentially what it means is when you're stressed or anxious or really just as a compulsion, you pull your own hair out. Um, and some people do their head, some people will do like their eyebrows, their eyelashes, some people will do arm hair, other things like that. Um, Chris's disorder was so severe that she had large bold spots on her scalp. The typical treatment for this is something that actually requires pretty high levels of cognition. Um, there's the expectation that uh, clients will be able to engage in conversations about why they're doing this and start to develop awareness about themselves doing this. And it's just, honestly, it just wasn't feasible with someone with Chris's developmental legs. So 
her therapist kind of really tried to find something that would work for her. And this is where you see the A being really long. Okay, typically A would only be a couple weeks. But because they were trying all different kinds of things on Chris, um, the A is like 30 sessions, which would typically be 30 weeks, although it could be 15 if she was being pinpointed. Um, and so what they decided to do is they said, let's set up a video camera and watch her while she manipulates her hair. And um, let's try just a really simple intervention. So they set up the video camera, they saw how much, and she liked to, she ended up doing it a lot while she watched TV. So they did it while she was watching TV. And then for their intervention that ended up working eventually, they uh, put two and a half pound just wrist weights on her wrist so that when she moved her arm, she was aware of it. Um, when they did that, all of her hair pulling stopped. And so as you can see, there had been other times they tried things and it worked for a little bit, but then it stopped working. So they needed to do the second A and take away those weights to see what happened. And as you can see, it returned to the same general range of fat. Then they reintroduced the weights and it stopped altogether. So the weights were found to be effective in stopping Chris's hair pulling and self-destructive behavior. So again, sometimes really simple behavioral things um, are better than like really fancy, complicated interventions. Alrighty, so now we're going to talk about uh, a few more of the things that your chapter gets into in terms of logistics surrounding research. So uh, in terms of research sample, we want to be able to draw conclusions from results that will apply to a larger group of people than who were actually studied, right? Um, this larger group is called the population. So in theory, if we're doing research, uh, people who live in the US, the population would be the entire US population, right? There's no way we could ever do a study where we collect data from everyone, just like expense-wise, feasibility-wise, it wouldn't happen. So instead, we use a smaller group called the sample. And as much as possible, we want this sample, which is a subset of the population, to be representative of the population as a whole. So the ideal is that we have similar, maybe age breakdown, racial breakdown, uh, things along those like gender breakdown, what have you. Um, so you can choose a random sample, which means each member of the population has an equal chance of being selected. So if we were to do this at Wesleyan, for example, um, then I could have a giant computer program randomly select emails from a subset of the Wesleyan population and then send emails to all those people inviting them to participate in our study. Now, in principle, we don't often do this, uh, partially because of time and expense. Um, typically, we use instead what's called a convenience sample which is just like the people available to us. Um, so oftentimes, as with you all for your PECs, that it is participant pools of people enrolled in psychology classes um, and who get extra credit or some other kind of compensation for participating. Um, now the other thing to think about is where are we doing these studies? And we talked a little bit about this um, when we were talking about experiments, right? So are we doing it in an artificial setting or are we doing it where they actually are? So laboratory research takes place in a controlled environment where the complex factors of the real world are removed. So there's lots of advantages in terms of controlling the, you know, those um, nuisance variables that we talked about before, but there are drawbacks. Um, if you go into a lab for a study, you know you're being observed, right? And you might change your behavior as a result. Um, it can feel really unnatural. Um, and some aspects of the mind and body are just hard to examine in a laboratory setting. So at Virginia Wesleyan, we have uh, a couple different laboratory settings we can use. There is a research lab that has several computers and also um, a space that has been used in lots of different ways for different studies. Um, we also have one of the one-way mirrors and can use that for research. Also, sometimes for my own personal studies, the lab is a classroom setting, 
so I'll just use a classroom, get as many people who want to participate at a given time slot as I can, and have them come in and do it there. Um, a lot of our 40 people, when they used to collect, a 40 is our capstone research course, sorry, <laughs> when uh, they used to collect data, would use one of the like, library study rooms, because it's good for one on one. When research is conducted in a natural setting, it's called naturalistic observation. Uh, and people's behaviors are being observed in real world situations. And sometimes you can do this uh, with their consent. Uh, and sometimes if it's gonna be completely anonymous, you don't even know who the people are, you're just noting down like a couple of behavioral observations, you actually don't have to get their consent to do this. So I think most people did really well on um, this question on our quiz. So kudos on that. I'm guessing you've got this drilled into you in high school math. Um, but descriptive statistics are used to describe and summarize data. Describe and summarize data. They're essentially showing us the big picture and helping us give our data meaning instead of being just a bunch of numbers. So um, there are three different measures of central tendency we tend to look at. And these show the overall characteristics of the data. So measures of central tendency show the overall characteristics of the data. Um, the mean is the average of the data. You basically just add all the scores together and then divide it by the total number of people that you have. Pretty simple. The median uh, is the score that falls directly in the center of the data set. Um, and you do this by like arranging your data from highest to lowest, that number that falls in the middle. And then the mode is the score that occurs most frequently in the data set. So median, is, or sorry, mean is average, medium, median is the middle, and mode is the most frequent. So mean, average, medium, middle, mode, most frequent. And again, a lot of you did really well on that, on the uh, point of the media quiz, so kudos. Then measures of dispersion, um, basically looks at how much our data vary. Are all our data the same, or do they really show a wide range of things within our sample? So the range is the distance between the highest score and the lowest score, so um, sometimes this is limited by the measure you give, right? So if you give a measure that only goes from one to seven, those are most likely gonna be your range, right? If you have a more elaborate measure with more nuance, it might really vary. Standard deviation is something you'll see quite a bit um, if you start reading scientific articles, even in the psychology journals. Um, so it measures how much scores vary on average around the mean. So I'll say that again because it's kind of wordy. Standard deviation measures how much the scores vary on average around the mean. The smaller the standard deviation, the less variability. So the more homogenous, the more alike your data are, the larger the standard deviation, the greater the variability within your data set. Inferential statistics are the mathematical methods we use to determine if data support the hypotheses. And there are a whole host of these. And if you decide to um, do the BS in psychology, uh, you will take our sets and methods class and you will uh, cover these in a lot of detail. But the biggest thing to know is that inferential statistics determine a statement of probability. And it tells us what the odds are that what we found was just an accident, just due to chance, right? So we want to know what is the likelihood that this is just a fluke, essentially. And that's what inferential statistics let us do. So in psychology, the significance level is set to 0 0.05 or 5%, which essentially means that the odds of this being just random or a fluke rather than something that actually exists are less than 5%. And so you'll often see this depicted as P, which is the probability, is less than 0.05. So basic thing, 
we do stats to tell us whether or not our hypotheses are supported with our data. Alrighty, and um, most of you did a good job with ethics as well. Um, if you decide to continue on to be a psych major, our capstone course is now uh, looking at ethics and professional issues across the many subfields of psychology. So I've been talking with our seniors about these issues. So uh, it's really important for psychologists, no matter which field they're in, what activities they're doing to follow ethical procedures. It is, you know, not only just do it to be a good person, right, do it to be professional, but also do it to maintain our positive relationship with the public. So, um, the real focus on this came about uh, personally after uh, World War II, and uh, part of what happened at concentration camps, which people don't realize, is that, um, Human subjects, they weren't participants, they didn't agree to participate, uh, were used as guinea pigs for medical research uh, without their consent and often without proper, uh, you know, anesthesia, things along this line. Um, we would also see a history of this for enslaved people, where, for example, new gynecological procedures would be practiced on slave women without their consent and without anesthesia. So obviously problematic, obviously something that there needed to be something done about. Um, so ethical guidelines were set up and researchers have an obligation to the research participant to anticipate issues in their study, to minimize those as much as they can, and to inform participants of possible side effects or consequences of participating in their study. So, um, one of the most important things that helps to maintain this is what's called the Institutional Review Board. Um, so the IRB, that's how this is usually abbreviated. And this is a board of faculty and sometimes also community members. Like uh, some IRBs will have a religious professional on them, for example, um, who review all of the proposals for research to be done at that institution. So for example, Virginia Wesleyan has one, the psychology department has spearheaded it because we do the most research on campus with human participants. Um, and so we review every protocol, whether it's by a faculty member or by a student, and we make sure that they're following all the ethical guidelines they need to follow and that there's not going to be harm done to their participants by doing this. Part of that, um, and all these ethics that I'm gonna talk about were developed by the American Psychological Association, but most subfields within mental health have similar uh, guidelines. So for example, there's one for counseling psychologists as well, that's fairly similar. So researchers must obtain what's called informed consent from participants prior to the start of the experiment or whatever kind of study they're doing. So participants have to know if there are any risks, what will be involved. So are they gonna fill out questionnaires or are they gonna have to like put on a chicken costume and dance around, right? They need to know these things. Um, and if there are any risks, they need to know those. And if certain activities will be part of this, sometimes the informed consent becomes more elaborate. So for example, I've been doing a study for several years where I have participants take pictures and post them on social media they actually have to sign a separate consent line uh, to agree to have their picture taken and posted. So again, just trying to protect the participants and they can say no at any point. And that's always part of the informed consent too, is that at any point during the process, they can say, no, I don't want to do this anymore and they can leave. Um, and so that's really important. Researchers are also responsible for the confidentiality of the data collected. So, you know, they need to de-identify it. Oftentimes, you'll be totally anonymous if it's an online survey. They won't even collect your information, uh, personal information with that. Um, other times, we'll de-identify it. Like in my studies, I often just assign each participant a number, uh, and then their data is only associated with that number, not their name. Um, you don't want to, you know, like, leave data just lying around with your laptop open and your data set open or like the papers just strewn out on a desk in the library right so you have to be careful 
about complementariality. The researcher is also responsible for what's called a debriefing. This means participants are informed of the experiment's true purpose and the methods that were used in the experiment. And this is partially, just again, for ethical reasons, to make sure the participant explain why they just went through that. Uh, but in academic settings, it's also for educational purposes so that you all understand uh, basic principles about psychological research. So um, oftentimes, if you do an online study, this will just be the last page of the survey. And it will include things like uh, contact information for the counseling center in case anything distressed you while taking the survey. Um, if you're in person, they might hand you a form or give you a verbal debriefing that explains what happened and why. This also might be, if it's a multi-part study, you might kind of debrief at a shallow level until the end of the study and then really explain. So when I do multi-part studies, on the last time, my debriefing is much longer because I'm really explaining why I was doing what I was doing. Deception is allowed in an experiment if telling participants in advance about what you're doing um, could potentially alter their behavior and invalidate the results of the experiment. So obviously you can do deception in really sketchy and unethical ways. And so we're very careful about using it. Um, but just to give you an example of uh, a study in my subfield. So one study about body image that they did, they had people try on either a sweater or a swimsuit. And then they said, and they told them it was for a marketing study. And then they said, oh, hey, well, while you have that on, can you help us with this other study too and fill out these math problems? And in fact, it was just to see if like the people in the swimsuits would get so distracted, they wouldn't do as well on the math test. And in fact, that's what they found. But if they told them, they, hey, since you're in a swimsuit, we think you might get distracted, so we're going to give you this math test, um, you know, it would have kind of ruined the integrity. Of the so, um, and then they had to carefully explain to people afterwards. The other important part of debriefing and deception is if you do anything that could be potentially harmful, you have to undo it. So like when we were talking about how you can have people read statements or listen to music that might make them feel depressed, you've got to undo that at the end of the study. You've got to make sure they leave your lab feeling okay. Uh, and then this is just sort of a silly cartoon about um, research methods, kind of pulling together a couple things uh, that we have talked about, I'm thinking about people being pessimists and maybe thinking critically about research as well. Alrighty, so since we do have some time, what I'm going to do is put you into some breakout rooms. Um, and this time around, let me share the link real quick. I have one Google Doc for everybody. Let me grab the shareable link here. And you're going to just, based on your group number, so pay attention when you're assigned, what group number it tells you you are, um, you're just going to fill out the page associated. So, each group is going to have a different ethical quandary uh, with some questions after it. Um, and we'll try 10 minutes, and if that's not enough time, then we will uh, come back together uh, and go back into our rooms. Um, so same thing as, and let me put the link out there so everybody can click on it. Again, there's one link, so make sure you're only working on your group's assigned study. There will be five groups, because that's how many case studies there are. Um, and I am going to set up the breakout rooms while I'm chatting here. So it'll be about six people per room. And I will set it for 10 minutes and then it will bring you back after your 60 second countdown. Um, and again, if you need more time at that point and make sure in your group, you designate a person to be your reporter um, who will tell the rest of the group about your case and what you've decided. And in fact, if you want, you can like make that more than one person in your group. All right, so you're gonna click on the document. You're going to find your group's assigned case, read it through together, and then answer the questions about it. All right, so I'm gonna open the rooms, just click okay. And again, notice your group number as you go.
Welcome back. <laughs> like there are some people who are finishing up, so they'll be here in about 30 seconds or so. Okay, Raven, you said your group needs more time. Let's wait till everybody's back and see if everybody needs more time. But right now I can't, it won't let me like reassign people, so. All right. I know there's a couple groups that need more time. Um, I know some other groups are done. So I'm going to go ahead and give you two more minutes. And if your answers aren't full paragraphs, that's okay. Just get something down there. So it'll be two minutes plus the countdown. So about three minutes. Okay, right, done. Um, yeah, here we go. yeah. Are we supposed to type it in the chat? Uh, no, just in the document, in the Google Doc. Oh, yeah. Are we supposed to type it in the document? Yes, yes. Okay. Yep. Yes, I'm going to reassign you for two minutes, which will actually be three minutes. Um, and if your group is done, you all can just chat. Talk about what you're doing over the weekend. Get to know each other. <laughs> all right, let me change the options. And then, again, if you're not perfect at the end of the three minutes, no worries. All right, I'm sending you all back. It. Well, I right. guess you can just ground rules to follow or something like that. Welcome back. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and share the Google Doc. So let me get that open here real quick. Um, and then each group can just talk about just very brief, like one or two sentence summary of their scenario. Um, and then if you want to talk about all three questions your group had, that's fine. If you want to just highlight one or two, that's okay too. Uh, we should be okay time-wise, but I also want to make sure we can get through all five groups. So I'm going to go ahead, like I said, share screen so everyone can see what the other groups wrote. Okay. So group one, whoever your designated person is, go ahead and again, brief summary of your scenario and then um, walk us through either all the questions or just one or two. Okay. Um, Jennifer thinks that because she wants to be a counselor, she doesn't really need research or any statistics or anything. She doesn't think that social workers should take research classes. Bethany, on the other hand, she is basing it solely on statistics, saying that human behavior hasn't changed really and people are more predictable than she thinks. Um, Bethany and Jennifer defer because, you know, Jennifer thinks that people are individuals but Bethany is based off statistics. Um, I personally agree with both of them at the same time. I think you need half and half. Um, Jennifer's take is eth ethically troubling because um, I think hers is ethically troubling because she's just saying that people are individuals, but what about if another person has that problem? She's not taking the time to research about, you know, other people who might help her with the problem or help her patient with the problem. Um, Bethany's is ethically troubling because she's just basing it off statistics. She's not worrying about whether the person has maybe genes or someone who also had that illness in her family or what she as an individual has been through to get her to, the, to where she is now. And 
That's it. Yeah, great job. I think you hit on everything. Um, the only other thing they say in like the book's answers to this, and I think you kind of hinted at this, is that if you do research, you don't know like what type of research, uh, what type of therapy works, right? And there is good research about that. So excellent job, group one. All right, let's go to group two. Okay, so our scenario was essentially um, Dr. Franklin, um, she had a treatment that she used for over 100 patients to help with panic attacks and then she decided to market it for other therapists to use and they wanted their money back because her treatment process didn't work for their patients. So for the first question, um, how would you explain that Dr. Franklin had so much success and the, other, and the others experienced failure? Uh, our response was one explanation for the lack of success was how Dr. Franklin led her patients through the technique as this could be a differentiating factor in how successful treatment was. Uh, okay, reliability analysts would have used different therapists to lead the patient through the technique to see if having different therapists caused the patient to have reduced panic attacks related feelings or emotions. This way they could rule out whether Dr. Franklin was the cause of the technique success or if it was the technique itself that had successful uh, that was successful regardless of the therapist performing it. For the second question, uh, from an ethical point of view, why should Dr. Franklin have done a reliability analysis before marketing her treatment? And Elijah put, the success of her treatment could be completely dependent on something she did as an individual. So in order to ensure the validity of her therapy, she should have scripted her sessions which she did and had another psychologist go through the same process with one of her own patients as well as another unrelated patient. If the results remain the same, then she would have been justified in selling it. And hold on. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and for the, yeah. some therapists, uh, uh, sorry, jump in real quick, then let's go. <laughs> there are some therapists who are just kind of magic, right? And mm -hmm. like clients get better no, almost no matter what they're doing, with that, which is great, but doesn't apply to other therapists. Yeah, and for the third one, keeping in mind that she never gave any false information to anyone who purchased her treatment program, do you think Dr. Franklin should give them a refund? Why or why not? And we put, Dr. Franklin should not be responsible for refunding any of their money because she did have success and many people did think her treatment worked for them. For 10 years, she found out that it reduced her client's panic attacks. She did not give false information, so she did nothing ethically wrong. Yeah, and this becomes an issue of legality, which is different than ethics. Right, so yeah, I think so. Alrighty, group three. Okay, so ours is about a woman named Karen and she's working with this doctor and they've been researching different um, flavors that mice like and don't like and how that kind of like um, coincides with like emotion and reactions. And um, basically she was reviewing this work before they went and presented it and saw that um, a number had been put in about 270 and it was actually 240, but she was concerned about um, whether she should approach the doctor about her mistake and how that would affect their um, data, especially since they were having it put into an ad academic journal. So um, for the first question, I said that she would be scared to tell the doctor, um, just either scared or embarrassed or worried what he might do. Maybe she would lose her job for making a mistake like that, especially for something that they were going to publish. Um, the second question, um, some negative consequences that might happen, just kind of like what I said, she might um, feel personally ethically um, wrong and struggle like if she kept that with her that she knew that she didn't tell him and that could also mess with her mentality um, later maybe during the presentation and then also she would be um, possibly fired or in the wrong of some sort and have that um, put out there during it and then finally um, a negative consequence that Will happen if they both don't tell the journal editor if someone had found out obviously they would lose their um their spot in that academic journal um people could probably um, say that they weren't credible anymore and they wouldn't be able to be that reliable in other cases and probably lose funding and such for lab material yeah those are all really good points and this happens sometimes um sometimes it's like this and it's completely unintentional 
And sometimes people completely fabricate their data, really sketchy. Um, so there's a couple recent uh, really sort of famous cases in psychology of people who've had to retract multiple, multiple papers because they find out they did this. Um, so not only does it make them look bad, it kind of makes us look bad as a science, right? Like we don't know what we're doing. All right, um, group four. Um, so Beverly is doing this experiment for Dr. Miserine, Miserindino, um, where she's observing these white, uh, white rats throughout the week. Um, but an emergency comes up on Saturday, so she isn't able to go to campus. So she considers to uh, just make up the data collection for Saturday using the data well, based off the data she collected for the rest of the week to uh, try to avoid Dr. Miserandino uh, becoming upset. And so the possible negative ethical consequences of this decision is that the data um, would therefore become inaccurate because it wasn't um, if, like act actually taken. And that's also why it would be risky is because that data would not be um, accurate and then if we were in Beverly's place we would instead of um, making up the data we'd explain to the doctor uh, that an emergency had come up even though they might be upset because of that. Yeah exactly that's the ethical thing to do and it, it might suck right and again she might be fired but it's better than fabricating uh, so that's really important to know. Um, yeah, and this is something that happens, particularly if you're doing time sensitive studies. So I had a friend in grad school who was working with rats and um, didn't time things out right. And so she had to be in the lab on Christmas. Um, so you have to kind of like be careful as you time out studies. Alrighty, so we'll go to group five. Our study um, was about a group of students um, for Dr. Taylor's research design and analysis class, they went to a mall to observe the interactions between mothers and their toddler children. Um, they were told not to interact with them, but just record how the mothers act to their children. Um, one of the mothers noticed, and I feel like most parents was a little bit disturbed by the fact that the students were just watching them and complained to mall security and security said, Please do not engage in any more research here without um, asking permission beforehand. It's a violation of privacy. Um, we agreed that we, um, we agree with the manager's concerns as um, it is quite disturbing if you have someone watching you and you notice they're taking notes and you just don't know what why they are there, why they are watching you, especially as a, if you were a parent, like I know as an older sister, if someone were to start just like watching my sister and taking notes, it, it would be quite disturbing. You don't know who these people are. You don't know what they are here for. I mean, there's a lot of sex trafficking and kidnapping now, human trafficking in general. So I we feel as a group that Dr. Taylor should have probably gotten, had the class obtain permission from um, the security and the managers at the mall to do like observation on the parents and the children and just like, and that way they're covered when, when someone reports to security, they can just be like, oh, they have permission to do this. Um, we gave them permission, they have the right documentation and all of that. Mm, helps if I unmute. I said, great, good job, everybody. Yeah, so I mean, here's a scenario where, yeah, exactly like Caitlin was saying, like you can just come off like a creeper, right? And you don't want to do that. <laughs> um, so yeah, letting someone know that this is going to happen. So when we do these types of studies on campus, it's where we do purely observational studies. But we let's. I know that a couple years ago someone did one in the grill, and they like let Jason know, so he knew what was going on and things like that. Um, so I think that uh, you know it's really important to yeah, act ethically, make sure people know what's going on. 
All right, well, we wrapped up early today, so I'm going to let you all go. Um, Simba came to say goodbye, so I'll get him over here. Oh, uh, he's so cute. He really is. <laughs> he's in trouble because he's like, he's sweet, but he's four, but acts like he's a tiny kitten, and that doesn't always work. Uh, <laughs> but everybody have a good Labor Day uh, as much as you can. <laughs> Stay safe, and I will see you on Wednesday. Bye. Bye.